you, Rob, and thank you to the OECD and especially Deputy Secretary General Connor San for really driving this agenda and inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you this morning. I think when we talk about the role of central banks in greening the financial system, it's really important to go back to the heart of the issue, which is how this links to their mandate and what the motivation is for central banks to play a role in this agenda. And this may be very well understood in this room, but it's not understood as broadly outside of perhaps the 46 central, ba um, central banks and supervisors that are member of the NGFS. There's over 170 central banks out there, so there's quite a lot that are not part of the network. Um, for some of them is because, yes, it is a coalition of the willing, and the network itself is setting very strict criteria in terms of central banks engaging with it. But it's also that in some jurisdictions, this link between the role of central banks and climate change and greening the financial system is not very obvious. And I think to understand the motivation is important to go back to this um, risk perspective that was also spoken about in the first uh, panel. And its governments have signed up to the Paris Agreement. This is something that central banks in those jurisdictions can take as a given that to get to that commitment and to achieve it, certain changes will have to be made that will impact the financial system. And in their role as regulators and supervisors of the financial system, they have a responsibility to address how this will impact financial stability. So there is a very clear link between financial stability and climate change and climate risk. So climate risk being a source of financial financial stability is really the core of the mission of the NGFS. And I think even for jurisdictions whose governments have not signed up to the Paris Agreement, and there are some very obvious um, members of the central banking community that are missing from the NGFS membership, I think it's important also to understand that even if their own governments have not signed up to this agreement, others have, and this will still, be an imp this will still have an impact to their own financial system. So um, it doesn't matter if your own government doesn't believe that climate change is an issue that should be dealt in the way that the Paris Agreement suggests. Um, the fact that governor of the Bank of England, governor of the ECB, president of the ECB, um, um, managing director of the IMF does is still going to have an impact on the financial institutions that you supervise. And I think that is a key distinction in terms of understanding um, what the NGFS is trying to do. I think in terms of the um, distinctions as well. We heard a lot this morning about there is a lot of fragmentation, there is different incentives. In some jurisdictions, climate change may be a motivation. In others, it may be pollution control, support of biodiversity. Um, there may be different social pressures, political pressures on what exactly we mean by greening the financial system. And I think the NGFS, um, speaking as the non-central banker on the panel, has done very well in being able to accommodate um, those different motivations. But at the same time, it it is becoming uh, a source of um, difficulty in terms of proceeding further. Um, and I think understanding, again, where different uh, governments, jurisdictions, and as a result, central banks that operate in them are coming from is also quite important. I think the tension also between the environmental and the social aspects of ESG is something that um, is important to, to hold in mind when progressing this agenda, because what do you do when the economic development of some countries requires decisions that may, to some extent, and hold back the climate or environmental agenda. I think these are very real issues for a lot of the developing and emerging market countries um, outside of the OECD that, um, that are dealing with these issues as well. And, and um, Deputy Secretary General Konosan spoke about this this morning as well. Uh, I think in terms of the, the challenges that we are facing now uh, in central bankers being able to defend this um, narrative that is very linked to their mandate, you're seeing uh, in the area of, for example, monetary policy and integrating climate issues in the conduct of monetary policy, even central bankers such as Yves Mersch, for example, uh, from the board of the ECB, saying that the biggest threat to uh, managing inflation is not the supply shocks that we may see from uh, extreme weather conditions uh, affecting uh, price volatility, but the fact that you may not have independent central banks to look after this because they're being attacked made on those central banks precisely because they may be seen to be doing things that are outside of their mandate. So I think the communication and sticking to the um, uh, narrative that this is within the mandate will be very important in order for these policies to be successful.
successful. Um, then in terms of the, the guide that um, Rianne and Enrico presented, I was very surprised to see that the primary motivation that a lot of these central banks mentioned in terms of integrating ESG in their portfolio manager management was the reputational risk. I think in other parts of the investment community, um, such as the sovereign wealth funds and the public pension funds that have uh, been perhaps more advanced in integrating ESG in their portfolio management, um, they've moved beyond that stage. It's no longer a value proposition and a reputation risk. It's very much about financial returns um, and the risk to their assets. So when we think about the physical risks to portfolios, infrastructure assets, real estate assets um, that uh, may be subject to a uh, natural disaster or gradual temperature raise um, uh, changes in um, where these assets are located, it will directly impact portfolios. Similarly, with the transition risks uh, in terms of uh, having assets that are in sectors that may not be considered to be part of the transition. Again, there is a very clear business case now. So what started as a very niche and value-oriented impact strategies among these investment communities is now becoming something that cannot be ignored. And we're seeing that more and more. In the case of uh, institutions that manage public money, like central banks in their reserve or policy portfolios, it's uh, also more about reputation. And I think that is an interesting distinction too. I'll, I'll stop here. I have more comments on the portfolio. Uh, management handbook, but we can talk about these in the discussion. Thank you. Very good, and I, and, I, and I appreciate your point because I do think, depending on the role of the institution, the the, the importance of rep.